Good morning, Carson Bible Church. If you would turn in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 9. This morning we are finishing chapter 9. We're working through verses 14 through 17. So if you would turn there and join me in prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for the great God that you are. We thank you for the gift of eternal life in your son Jesus, in his work on the cross, and his victory over death. We thank you for our adoption into your family through your Holy Spirit. God, you are such a great God, and you are worthy and deserving of all of our praise. We do ask that your Holy Spirit would give us wisdom and insight as we approach your word this morning, and that we would apply it rightly to our lives, and that our lives would be honoring and glorifying to you. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, if you have your Bibles open to Zechariah chapter 9, as I said, we're working through verses 14 through 17. Again, as the last couple of weeks, we have essentially a one-point sermon. The point of the sermon today is that God will defend Israel. We saw in verses 1 through 8 of chapter 9 that God will pour out wrath on the enemies of Israel. We saw in verses 9 through 13 that the Messianic King is coming. And now as the chapter closes, we see that God will defend Israel. Now I know some of you have pointed out over the last couple of weeks that I keep saying it's a one-point sermon and it actually turns out to be a one-point sermon with like nine or ten subpoints. Well, it's kind of the same today. It's a one-point sermon, but we have one point illustrated in four images. So I'm going to go ahead and read the passage. Starting in verse 14. Then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts will protect them, and, he, and they shall devour and tread down the sling stones. And they shall drink and roar as if drunk with wine, and be full like a bowl, drenched like the corners of the altar. On that day, the Lord their God will save them as the flock of his people. For like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on his land. For how great is his goodness, and how great his beauty. Grain shall make the young men flourish, and new wine the young women. Well, as I said, one point is that God will defend Israel. And that point is going to be developed in four images here. In a storm, in a sacrifice, sheep, and stones. And yes, they all conveniently start with the same letter S to make for easy note-taking because I'm a preacher and we love alliteration. If you don't have any alliteration skills, then all I am is just a mustache and glasses with no personality. So, one point in four images. Storm, sacrifice, sheep, and stones. Why four images? I think what's going on with Zechariah here is, you know when you become a new parent and all of a sudden every conversation becomes a reason for you to pull out pictures of your child and maybe you're not the new parent, maybe you're just the coworker of a new parent, and you get uh, increasingly bored with constant images of a baby that all look the same to you, but you have to sit through picture after picture after picture after picture, right? But when you're a new parent, and you have this new child, and you're so excited and everything relates to that new baby in your house. And so everything becomes an occasion to talk about your new baby or to show pictures of your new baby or talk about 
all the milestones. I mean, think about the milestones of the first couple of years in a baby's life, right? Sitting up, crawling, walking, talking, new teeth. All of these things are, are these important milestones. And as a parent, you get really excited to share those things. Or maybe you don't have human children and you're one of those people who has fur babies and you think everybody needs to see pictures of your dog or your cat and we all get very annoyed and bored with those pictures. Let me just be honest. But I think that's what's going on with Zechariah. Zechariah is so caught up in these promises that God is making to his people. He's so excited in sharing this message with his people. The, the idea that God is going to pour out wrath on those people groups that have oppressed Israel that will be fulfilled in another couple hundred years from Zechariah's time by Alexander the Great. And the idea that this messianic king is coming and he's going to be unlike any other king that the world has ever known or seen. And he's going to transform God's people when he comes. And that won't happen for another 500 and something years or so from Zechariah's time. But these are really exciting promises. And as God goes on with this imagery and shows and promises that he will defend his people, Israel, in these really powerful ways, I think uh, Zechariah is just really so excited about it. And he's so caught up in the message. And he's just seeing every single thing as an occasion to use as an illustration for how God is over his people and will protect them. So let's get started. Verse 14, then the Lord will appear over them and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. Verse, verse, verse 14 illustrates God's protection over his people like a storm. Then the Lord will appear over them. This really, really speaks to uh, the worldview of ancient people and the way they viewed battle between people groups. Right? The whole idea was that the deity of each people group was on the battlefield above them. And as the people engaged in battle on the ground, so the deities engaged in battle in the heavens. And whichever deity was more powerful was the group of people, was the army that emerged victorious. And so that's how gods actually come and go in the ancient world, is if your people group is defeated by another people group, then their deity must be superior to yours, and so you begin to worship that deity, which again, as we've talked about in the past, goes to how unthinkable it was for God to say that he was ordaining Israel's exile, that God was at work in Assyria, carrying off the northern kingdom, Israel, and Babylon coming to carry off the southern kingdom of Judah. Because in the ancient world, in an ancient worldview, no God would ever do that for a people group to be carried off as exiles meant that their God had failed them. But what God is showing in that exile is his sovereignty actually over all other deities in that he ordained Israel's exile and he actually is the one who brings Israel out of exile as well. So this says that the Lord will appear over them. This is what we call a theophany. This is um, God being imaged in the, in the real world. This is uh, humanity getting a glimpse 
of God in some way revealing himself to them. It says, His arrow will go forth like lightning, and the Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. We've seen God depict himself as a storm in other parts of Scripture, right? Remember when Moses has the people at the foot of the mountain in Exodus 19, and God is appearing to them as this raging storm at the top of the mountain. And God, uh, to sort of summarize the encounter, God invites the people, and the people are terrified. And they say, no, we don't want to go. Moses, you go in our place. And God says, yeah, you made the right choice. Don't even touch this mountain. He calls Moses up the mountain and gives the Ten Commandments and seals Israel as his people in a covenant relationship with him. We see God depicted as a storm, for example, in Psalm 29 as well. And one really interesting thing, this storm motif will sort of continue into chapter 10 later. But it's interesting also when we see Elijah on the mountain with the prophets of Baal. Baal was a storm god. And Elijah invites them to this sort of showdown on the mountain, and he invites the challenges, the God who answers with fire, right, which was probably lightning. And you remember they're also in the middle of a drought. So the invitation actually is for Baal to do what he should be able to do best, right? But up to that point, Baal, the storm god, had failed to provide any rain. And he fails to answer with fire. He fails to send lightning. And it's interesting, right in their face, then Elijah takes a whole bunch of water, which likely would have been in short supply in the middle of a drought, and drenches the altar in sacrifice. And God, of course, being the true God, answers with fire, answers with lightning. His arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet. When, when the Lord sounds a trumpet, it will sound like thunder. And will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. Imagine... Imagine the power of a storm that God is in. We understand how devastating just natural storms can be. Absolutely devastating to our structures, to our societies, to utilities. Now imagine the power of God in a storm defending his people. God will defend Israel. Verse 15 moves on to another illustration, another image, the image of a sacrifice. The Lord of hosts will protect them. And they shall devour and tread down the sling stones, and they shall drink and roar as if drunk with wine, and be full like a bowl, drenched like the corners of the altar. This says the Lord of hosts will protect them. Remember that term, the Lord of hosts, refers to God's angelic armies. He is the commander of heavenly armies. He himself will protect Israel, and they shall devour and tread down the sling stones. I know we think of the sling in the story of David and Goliath, and we think of it as just this uh, humble weapon. But in the ancient world and in ancient warfare, slingers were formidable warriors. They worked in tandem with archers, and in some cases, 
would replace archers is a long-range weapon and the slingers could be quite accurate. They were an important component of ancient warfare. But here it says that God's people will devour and tread down the sling stones. See, with the Lord himself protecting them, those formidable weapons of war are easily deflected to the ground, and God's people will just walk right over them. And they shall drink and roar as if drunk with wine, and be full like a bowl, drenched like the corners of the altar. This is the imagery of sacrifice, right? Is that um, often a sacrifice coincides with a feast, and the idea here is that after being victorious in battle under the Lord, God's people will have this huge feast, and the sacrifice seems to actually be their enemies. And it's a little bit gruesome here that they are raging in such a way as to say that they shall drink and roar as if drunk with wine and be full like a bowl, right? The idea of an altar with a bowl where the sacrifice is made and the idea is that the bowl is a container for the blood of the sacrifice. And here it actually runs out over the corners of the altar. Um, as I say, the, the imagery is a little bit gruesome here. For the bowl to overflow, we're talking about a significant amount of blood. But such is Israel's victory when the Lord is her protector. Verse 16 has our final two images. On that day, the Lord their God will save them as the flock of his people. On that day is kind of a fixed phrase in Scripture, and it refers to the day of the Lord, right? It refers to all of God's wrath poured out on his enemies. It refers to the day of judgment. On that day, the Lord their God will save them. Even the way that God is referred to here has sort of made this progression from the Lord in verse 14 to the Lord of hosts in verse 15 and now the Lord, their God. He will save them as the flock of his people. And we see God portrayed as a shepherd uh, over and over in Scripture, right? It's a, it's a part of the, the reason that God chose David to be king over Israel. He had a shepherd's heart. It's a part of why Jesus says, I am the good shepherd in the Gospel of John. God gathers his people as a shepherd, and they will be uh, like his flock, as he protects them, provides for them, cares for them. In the second half of verse 16, for like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on his land. His land, meaning the land of Israel, the land promised to Abraham, which for Zechariah's generation is not all that attractive. Remember, desolation was a part of them going into exile. It was a part of the consequences for having broken covenant with God. The land was desolate at this point. And God says that under him and his protection, his people will shine like 
precious stones. It's his people that will beautify this land. And it's interesting that God has gone from the imagery of sling stones just a couple verses before and weapons of war to his people being precious stones, gems, like gems in a crown. And then verse, I'm sorry, chapter 9 closes with verse 17. For how great is his goodness and how great his beauty. Grain shall make the young men flourish in new wine, the young women. Now, it's maybe not the best idea to rejoice in giving wine to young women. But the imagery here is abundance. The imagery is younger generations flourishing and doing well. Uh, we know what warfare often does to the younger generations of a nation. Nations that end up in long-term warfare are often just missing generations of young men. But God says, that under his command, warfare actually will produce abundance. The younger generations will flourish. Prosperity, especially agricultural prosperity, will return to their land. And I think there's some important things going on in this passage for Zechariah's generation and for us as well. Because as much as Zechariah has already heard from God this, this important proclamation, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, when we read this passage, God's people, Israel, seem to be active in God's warfare on his enemies, don't they? As much as the previous verses set up Israel to be instruments of war in God's hand, here they are raging victorious in battle. They are the ones treading down the enemy, treading down the sling stones, right? Israel's very active here in this imagery. They're not passive. I think it speaks a lot to how God's sovereignty is often worked out on the earth through human agents. Because although all of this is God's work, there is work for us to do as well as a part of it. This interesting thing happens with Moses. In Exodus 6, when God tells Moses that he's about to unfold plagues on Egypt, he uses this phrase and he says, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And that phrase gets repeated throughout the Old Testament, uh, referring to how God will rescue his people Israel. But then in the following chapters of Exodus, we see Moses and Aaron meeting Pharaoh at the river, and they are literally stretching out their hands and arms and bringing these plagues upon Egypt. So, whose mighty hand and whose outstretched arm? Well, God's, of course. But also Moses's? Yeah. And also Aaron's? Yes. See, Moses has 
a number of shortcomings, but when Moses is at his best, as you read through Scripture, it sometimes becomes difficult to tell where Moses ends and where God begins. Moses' work as a human agent is almost indistinguishable from God's sovereign work among his people. I think that's important for us to remember today. God shared these promises through Zechariah and to Zechariah's generation for a reason. Because although a number of these things are, were future events for Zechariah and his generation, and some of them are still future for us, these things haven't happened yet. We haven't seen Israel with this scale of victory over enemies historically. But these promises become motivating because no doubt there were people in Zechariah's generation who thought, okay, we've left exile, we're back home, this is restoration. This is, messianic kingdom is going to happen right now, and yet, messianic kingdom didn't happen right away. And full restoration of Israel hasn't happened yet. But that meant that Israel still had work to do. Remember that the charge is to rebuild the temple. They will have to rebuild the city walls of Jerusalem. There was plenty of work for them to do. And it could easily become very exhausting and overwhelming. And it would be easy to let that work fall by the wayside. But to hear these promises of God that are still yet future is motivating to continue in our work. And it's a good reminder that this is ultimately God's work. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. How many of us feel like our burden is still heavy? How many of us find that we don't have rest? How many of us find that we're trying to do God's work in our own strength rather than by His Spirit. Paul the Apostle. If you know anything about Paul's life, you know he was no slouch. And he said, By the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 10. In Colossians 1, 29, he says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. How many of us look around and say, I don't know how much longer I can keep this up. I don't know how much longer I can keep doing this, God. I think maybe it's a good reminder for us to go to God in prayer and consider 
if we've been working and trying to get God's results with our own efforts. Because as much as people in Zechariah's generation might have thought that full restoration was right around the corner and Messiah was going to be there soon, there was still quite a lot of work ahead of them to do. And I know that for a lot of us, it's really tempting to see the news and see some things going on in the world and even closer to home. And it starts to sound like maybe these are things that I've read about in Revelation. Maybe, maybe this is the end. And we say, God, I can't do this anymore. Um, I think it's possible that we've still got quite a long time ahead of us. I don't know for sure. I think the best metric for when Jesus is going to return is given to us by Jesus himself. He said in Mark chapter 13, verse 10, the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And as we mentioned before, virtually all nations, as we think of them, geopolitical nations, have some believers, some followers of Christ, some disciples. But as the Bible talks about nations, as in people groups, the gospel has really only reached maybe two-thirds or three-fourths of the people groups of the world. That's still a lot of people left to reach. And as much as Zechariah's generation was tasked with building the temple, our generation has been tasked with making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that Christ has commanded us. Our God's future promises motivating to us to be diligent in that work and to do it in the strength of God's Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you what I mean. These promises from Zechariah are great promises if you are the people of God. And if you are not a part of God's people, it's a terrifying place to be on that side of God's wrath. When we think about what it looks like for God to pour out wrath and punishment on his enemies, then doesn't it cease to be laborious work to warn them and to invite them into a saving knowledge of the only one and only true Savior, Jesus, and his work on the cross and his resurrection from the grave, that they would too be under the protection of the Lord of hosts rather than subject to his wrath? Then the Holy Spirit is energizing to us it should become a motivation to us to be diligently in that work. Today for our in-person services, we are celebrating communion. One of the things that Paul says to the Corinthians is that as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I know that we look around and we say, How long, O oh Lord? How long until He comes?
Yes, we are to be about the work of proclaiming the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes. And yes, we long for him to return. Yes, we desire to him, we desire for him to return. We say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But at the same time, we heed the warning of the Old Testament prophets, do not long for the day of the Lord, for that day is darkness and not light. My prayer is that you and I, as God's people, would be on our knees in prayer with God, searching out how much have we been trying to do in our own efforts and how weary and heavy laden are we trying to get God's results in our own strength. And how can we rest in Christ? And how can we rest in the grace through his Holy Spirit to be hard at work proclaiming the kingdom of Christ and calling others out of darkness into light? Because we know the terror of being on the wrong side of God's wrath. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, what amazing and beautiful promises these are to your people. God, we are thankful that we are counted among your people through Jesus who bore your full wrath on himself, your wrath and punishment for sin, which was ours that we deserved and not him. And yet he took it upon himself in our place that we might be a part of your heavenly family. God, help us to remember the cost that we might be energized by the grace that you've shown us to go out and call others and invite them into the kingdom of your Messiah, of King Jesus, that they too would know eternal life. We pray that in his name. Amen.